From the inmate who was tragically killed within his first 24 hours behind bars to those crammed into cells with 400 others, the first day in prison is often a harrowing ordeal. New arrivals face a wide range of mistreatment, from violence to extreme overcrowding as they navigate the brutal realities of their new environment. In this video, we'll take an unfiltered look at what inmates endured during those critical first 24 hours in prison, shedding light on the fear, chaos, and survival tactics that define their earliest moments behind bars. Naum, a 28-year-old man, had wrestled with his inner demons for most of his life. Growing up in a tough neighborhood, he was no stranger to the unforgiving realities of life. Despite his efforts to carve a better path, he became ensnared in the relentless grip of drug addiction and financial hardship. With his wife pregnant and the birth of his daughter looming, the weight of responsibility bore down on him like never before. He needed money, and he needed it fast. On a fateful Saturday evening, desperation overtook Nam, leading him to a choice that would forever alter the course of his life. High on cocaine, he resolved to rob a bar, believing it was the only way to provide for his family. Armed with a plastic gun that looked convincingly real, he embarked on his plan. Storming into the bar, Naum brandished the fake weapon and shouted demands for money. The patrons and the bar owner froze in fear, unable to tell the imitation from an actual firearm. In Brazil, where the law makes no distinction between real and toy weapons in crimes, Naum's actions carried dire consequences. Unbeknownst to him, the police had been alerted and arrived on the scene within minutes, surrounding the bar and cutting off any hope of escape. Naum was arrested on the spot. Pleading with authorities, he insisted, I've done nothing wrong, it's a misunderstanding. But his claims fell on deaf ears. The fear he had incited with a fake gun was all too real, and the evidence against him was overwhelming. At the police station, the situation worsened. Naum admitted to his struggles with drugs and occasional alcohol abuse, but his confession only strengthened the case against him. He was charged with aggravated robbery, a crime carrying a sentence of up to 15 years in prison. His thoughts immediately turned to his family. I'm desperate. My family needs me, he lamented. His wife was due to give birth any day, and he feared missing the arrival of his daughter. Instead of being reunited with his family, Naum was sent to a pre-trial detention facility where he would await a judge's decision. Even for a minor offender like him, the measures were severe. Brazil, home to the world's second largest cocaine market, is a battlefield for law enforcement and drug gangs, necessitating intense security for all detainees. Naum's transport to the Porto Velho prison complex was heavily guarded, highlighting the gravity of his predicament. Upon arrival, Naum was confined to a cage in sweltering heat, awaiting his video conference hearing. The conditions were inhumane, but he clung to a fragile hope that he might soon be released. That hope was shattered the following morning when he faced the judge. The bar owner, whom Naum had prayed would abstain from testifying, took the stand and provided damning evidence against him. The judge, after hearing the testimony, announced that the decision to press formal charges would be communicated by mail. For Naum, this meant an extended stay in uncertainty. Unable to afford legal representation, he was powerless to influence his fate. If convicted, he would be sent to the infamous maximum security prison known as 6003, a fortress notorious for its harsh conditions and rigid security protocols. As Naum languished in the detention facility, the weight of his choices bore down on him. His dreams of redemption and family life seemed to slip further away with each passing day, leaving him to confront an uncertain and perilous future. Jeffrey Epstein Jeffrey Epstein's incarceration in 2008 was marked by an unprecedented level of privilege that starkly contrasted with the experiences of most convicted sex offenders. While Florida law typically sends such offenders to state prison, Epstein was instead housed in a private wing of the Palm Beach County stockade. This arrangement, which shielded him from the general inmate population, was just the beginning of a series of extraordinary accommodations. Upon his arrival, Epstein bypassed the standard intake process, which usually includes strip searches, medical evaluations, and orientation. Instead, he was discreetly escorted to his private quarters. Epstein, a financier with connections to the world's elite, had pleaded guilty to procuring a minor for prostitution in June 2008, a conviction that many believed would finally deliver justice for his victims. Yet the terms of his plea deal and the conditions of his incarceration revealed a justice system bent under the weight of his wealth and influence. Epstein's plea deal was widely criticized for its leniency. He agreed to plead guilty to a single state charge of procuring a minor for prostitution, receiving an 18-month sentence, a year of probation, 
and the requirement to register as a sex offender. This sentence was alarmingly light, given the scope and severity of his crimes, which involved the systematic exploitation of underage girls. Perhaps even more shocking was the plea deal's non-prosecution agreement, which granted immunity to potential co-conspirators, effectively shielding many of Epstein's associates from prosecution. Despite the 18-month sentence, Epstein served just 13 months and spent only three and a half months in jail before being granted work release privileges that defied standard procedures. The work release allowed him to leave the jail for up to 12 hours a day, six days a week, ostensibly to work at a foundation he had created shortly before his incarceration. This arrangement directly violated sheriff's policies, which disqualified sex offenders and required a remaining sentence of 10 months or less for eligibility. During his work release, Epstein's privileges extended far beyond the norm. His cell door remained unlocked, and he was moved to a previously unstaffed infirmary, further isolating him from other inmates. The sheriff's office received $128,000 from Epstein's nonprofit to cover overtime costs for deputies who monitored him. These deputies, dressed in suits, acted more like personal assistants checking in guests at Epstein's office, a detail that led to the destruction of visitor logs under the pretense of departmental retention rules. However, stockade visitor logs revealed that Epstein's personal driver transported him between the jail, his office, and other appointments, allowing him freedoms unheard of for a convicted sex offender. Epstein was released on July 22, 2009, after serving just 13 months. His subsequent probation under house arrest lasted until August 2010, during which he enjoyed further leniency. He was permitted to take trips on his private jet to his homes in Manhattan and the U.S. Virgin Islands, as well as shopping excursions and long walks around Palm Beach. These liberties further highlighted the disparity in treatment between Epstein and others convicted of similar crimes. The glaring inequities in Epstein's sentencing and incarceration underscored the corrupting influence of wealth and power on the justice system. While his initial jail term was marked by luxury and privilege, his subsequent imprisonment following his 2019 arrest was starkly different. Held among the general prison population apart from periods on suicide watch, Epstein's second stint behind bars ended abruptly when he was found dead in his cell on August 10, 2019, under circumstances that sparked widespread speculation and controversy. His death became a grim epilogue to a life characterized by exploitation and the abuse of power. El Chapo. El Chapo's arrival at ADX Florence in 2019 marked the start of a grim new chapter in his life. The infamous drug lord, once the powerful leader of the Sinaloa cartel, was transported under tight security to the Supermax prison, a facility renowned for its unyielding security measures and austere living conditions. The intake process began the moment he arrived, designed to strip him of all traces of his previous life. Guards subjected him to a thorough and invasive strip search, inspecting every part of his body for contraband. This humiliating procedure was the first step in his complete dehumanization. He was then issued a standard prison uniform, a stark contrast to the lavish clothing he once wore, symbolizing his transformation from a cartel kingpin to just another inmate in the Alcatraz of the Rockies. El Chapo's cell was a stark, 7 by 12 foot concrete enclosure, a far cry from the opulence he once enjoyed. The sparse furnishings, a bed desk and chair, were all made of concrete and bolted to the floor to prevent them from being used as weapons. The cell also contained a toilet and a time-controlled shower designed to prevent flooding. A narrow 42 inch tall by 4 inch wide window let in minimal light and offered no view of the majestic Rocky Mountains outside, further isolating him. The soundproof walls ensured he could not communicate with other inmates, amplifying his solitude. Every aspect of El Chapo's life was tightly controlled by the prison guards. From the timing of his meals to the hours of light in his cell, nothing was left to his discretion. At night, the lights were turned off at specific times, plunging him into darkness and reinforcing his loss of power. For 23 hours a day, he was confined to this concrete box, with only an hour allowed for recreation. Even during this brief respite, he was taken to a small concrete yard resembling an empty swimming pool, surrounded by high walls that blocked any view of the outside world. Under the constant supervision of three guards, he could either walk 10 steps in a straight line or 31 steps in a circle, an exercise designed to maintain minimal physical health while preserving his psychological disorientation. The transition from a life of luxury and command to the oppressive confines of ADX Florence was a profound shock to El Chapo. 
Once a man who controlled vast territories and moved billions of dollars in drugs, including marijuana, cocaine, heroin, and methamphetamine, he now lived in stark isolation. At its height, the Sinaloa cartel dominated 40% to 60% of Mexico's drug trade, generating an estimated $3 billion annually. But here, all his power meant nothing. Supporters of ADX Florence argued that individuals like El Chapo deserved the harsh treatment due to the scale of their crimes. The Sinaloa cartel was responsible for immeasurable suffering, from the devastation of communities by drugs to violence and corruption that reached across borders. Others, however, have criticized the conditions at ADX Florence as inhumane, claiming that such isolation and deprivation push inmates to the brink of madness. For El Chapo, the reality of his new life was inescapable. Gone were the days of wealth, influence, and escape. Now he faced a daily existence defined by confinement, control, and isolation, a far cry from the empire he once commanded. Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. Don't forget to like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and hit the bell icon so you won't miss any of our future deep dives. Thanks for watching, and as always, stay safe, stay curious, and I'll see you in the next video.